I think being able to fail and own your failure is critical for good leadership. I don't always communicate well. I don't always give people the space they need, but I am able to recognize it, not immediately, always, but eventually, and own it and give people grace, but also give myself grace in the process. Hello, and welcome to the Mind Your Leadership podcast. I'm Karen Sook, and today I have the pleasure to host Nancy Lyons. Nancy is the CEO and co-founder of Clockwork. Nancy is a passionate advocate for cultivating work environments that are more inclusive, flexible, and adaptable. Having navigated through challenging professional experiences herself, Nancy is on a mission to revolutionize the way we work. In her insightful books, Interactive Project Management, Pixel People and Processes, and the recently released Work Like a Boss, a Kick in the Pants Guide to Finding and Using Your Power at Work, Nancy shares a human-centered approach to work that empowers individuals and fosters better collaboration. Join us as we explore how we can all contribute to creating a cultures that, and spaces that truly work for humans and humanity embracing their complexities and nuances. Welcome, Nancy. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. It's nice to be here. It's my pleasure. I'm looking forward to our conversation. So, you know, I looked at your LinkedIn profile and you proudly claim titles such as founder, entrepreneur, keynote speaker, author, advocate, activist, and rebel. The Mm -hmm. one that caught my eye is the rebel one. Mm -hmm. Can you share more about what being a rebel means to you and how it influences your approach to leadership and advocacy? Sure. Um, Well, I think I call myself a rebel because I don't fit a mold um, of other CEOs or leaders. And I think that for me, I think I can read a lot of business books. I, I remember giving a guest lecture for an MBA class at St. Thomas University and as I, and this was years ago, probably 20 years ago, as I was walking out and it was when I was involved in uh, our first company, when I was president of uh, an ISP and um, technology company, and I was walking out with one of the students and I said, gosh, I, I should probably get an MBA, right? I, I should probably go back to school. I think about it all the time, but I, I, I haven't done it. And she looked at me and she said, why would you? She said, I'm doing this so that I can do what you're doing. Um, she said, and you're getting it with real experience. And I think, you know, that was sort of my first glimpse into what it meant to sort of pave your own way and recognize you know, the gifts or the talents that we have as individuals that we can apply to leadership and culture building and organizational building and the health of companies. And I have always um, put people first in all of the work that I've done in any organization that I've been involved with. In my mind, leaders are nothing without their workforce, without their humans. And to think about humans as capital or to think about humans as numbers or to force people to work beyond their comfort zones to deliver on numbers or to dehumanize them in any way like that is counter to my personal values. And so initially, I feel like I was a rebel simply because that was my focus. And I think as I evolved and as I matured, and obviously I'm mature now, um, I think what I decided to do was pay less attention to how everybody else does it and pay more attention to what I learn and what I know to be true as a result of those lessons. So I'm a rebel because I'm doing it my way. So I love it. I think it's such an important thing to bring our authentic self and to bring path our own way, right? Because this is the, what we're bringing to the workplace. And you know, it's so interesting. You talked about your leadership style that evolved during the years and building your own company. So you say this is what a, like an epiphany moment for you to understand what's important for you. But from your experience, you're saying, what did you embrace during the, your journey that works for you? And what did you see that 
people misconceptions of leaders that you said, okay, this is not for me. I'm not going to do it to embrace it because I don't think it's the right way for me, maybe for them. Mm-hmm. Well, I think, I think the best role models are the worst bosses, right? So I think um, for me, I made choices to not be like bosses that I've had in the past. Um, <laughs> you know, a lot of those bosses were micromanagers. They wanted to prescribe how people worked. And I feel like um, the way we work was really defined during the Industrial Revolution when culture was very different, when the people that were where the bosses, the leaders inside of organizations were the ones who owned the organization or had great wealth. But whatever it was that put them in that position, there was a massive chasm between those people that had the wealth and those people doing the work. But as a, as a result of, um, you know, our evolution, as a result of access to opportunity and resources, We are hiring our peers now. We're hiring people. Hopefully, I'm hiring people that are better than me. That's always my goal. And so to micromanage or prescribe how people should work simply because I got here first makes no sense to me. We are all teachers and students. And so for me, I think, you know, some of the biggest lessons I've learned is um, and and the way that I've I've chosen to work is to surround myself with people that are smarter, that have big ideas ideas that aren't afraid of risk or uh, or can take initiative and to give them the runway to do their best work. And inevitably, that makes me look great, right? Like, I'm not really doing, I, I'm not, I'm not performing magic behind a curtain. I'm letting people be them their best selves. And I'm encouraging culture where we create more of that. So I think that has been the biggest uh, lesson for me and the biggest opportunity for the organizations that I've been involved with. Just get out of their way. Even this year, you know, I'm, I'm gratified because I sort of outlined for my company a strategic framework that I wanted us to consider for 2024. And now my leadership team has defined how to apply that strategic f- framework, how to set goals against that strategic framework, and how to hold one another and the teams accountable for meeting the goals that they've identified. So I feel like, you know, I get to operate at my highest and best use. And my goal is to do that for the people that I work with too. I'm listening to you and, you know, I couldn't agree more. You say that your essential value is to empower others, to bring better people than you. But, you know, as I see it, I think a lot of, leaders and managers, you know, acting out of ego and they want to be seen. And then once someone else is seen better than them, they are terrified. So they sometimes belittle them. So how do you think, how you will advocate or invite people to overcome these challenges? Because it's a big challenge, you know, to, to really be present and to believe in what you bring and to be comfortable in your skin and understand that other comp- bring different, uh, different aspects that complete you. But I think it's a challenging thing. You talk about it really natural, and I, I'm sure you went through a long journey and process to get to this point. So if a, a new manager or leader listens to you, or even not a new, a virtual one, but wants to accomplish what you accomplish, what the baby step that you will take him through? Sure. Um I think it's important to develop ego strength. You brought up the word ego. um, And I think we are all driven by ego, right? I don't think people pursue leadership without having uh, ego involved. And I can't say that I'm perfect all the time because I think, especially as women, I think women feel a lot of pressure to demonstrate what they've produced or what they've created Um, They want to be able to point to that thing they did in order to be validated, because I think women are the tracks we we pursue are different, but also what we are asked to to produce is is different. Um, I think we have to work harder to prove our abilities, our leadership skills. So it's harder, I think, for women to go, I'm going to let go 
and I'm going to give this person that opportunity. I also think that women are trained in a covert way to mistrust other women. So it's even harder, I think, to empower other women and to believe that they have your best interests at heart. And I say all that to say, I'm not perfect. I have moments where I'm like, what is going on here? And I have to bring myself back to my center and remind myself, you know, we all have these little demons on our shoulders that tell us stories that aren't true. I don't care who you are. I don't care how you show up in the world. I don't care how positive you are. We all have these old tapes that play in our in our heads. And so I do have moments of weakness where I have to bring myself back to my center and remember that I know what I'm doing, that I that I know that this is right. And I don't have to point to a thing to get brownie points. Right. I can. I can celebrate the wins of other people and recognize, even if it's just me, that I played a role in those wins, in those victories. And so I would I would encourage anybody starting out in leadership who feels like they want to embrace this idea of empowering other people or stepping back and giving people space to be to do their best work. I would encourage them to consistently focus on their strength of ego um, and recognize that we're not doing a show. We're actually trying to build a living thing that should last beyond us. And in order to do that, it's imperative that we create these mutually trusting experimental environments. In other words, we have to leave room for failure we have to have room for those weak moments and we have to forgive ourselves when we have them, get back to our center and move on. So what I heard you say that I think it's really crucial and important in embracing this journey is the trust aspect and trust, mm -hmm. as you said, start within ourselves. So we first of all need to trust ourselves that we are worthy, right? Even that we are women or new managers or veteran managers that have uh, ego issues we need to go, I think, to embark inside ourselves and to mm -hmm. find our strengths and know what our weaknesses are. Because as you said, we are not uh, perfect. We are a complete person, but each and every one of us has weakness and strengths, right? And we need to know ourselves and mm -hmm. be mindful of ourselves. And once we trust ourselves and we know what is our added value, we won't, be, we won't feel uncomfortable that others will bring their added values. And beyond this, it will help us trust the process and sometimes trusting the process is creating the space and holding the uncertainty, not knowing the answer. As you said, I decided on the strategy and my leadership team decided how they would do it. You didn't have control over it. You gave them this control. And I believe that you hold the space for them of not knowing how to get there. And they, it evolved during the conversation, right? The dialogue that they had. Mm hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, going back to this idea of the, the picture of leadership that we hold um, doesn't leave a lot of room for failure or humanity. Right. And I think both of those things are essential to good leadership. Frankly, I think being able to fail and own your failure is critical for good leadership. I don't always communicate well. I don't always give people the space they need, but I am able to recognize it, not immediately, always, but eventually, and own it and give people grace, but also give myself grace in the process. I also think, um, you know, this idea, when we go back to sort of the, the, the ideal leader, they're supposed to, in our minds, know everything about the company, about the market, about that's impossible. That is, that is not actually possible. I think what makes a great leader is adaptability and curiosity. I don't have to know any, everything. I have to have the ability to say, I don't know, but I can find somebody who will have the answer or I can find the right answer in my research. And I am brave enough to do that. Um, I, I think there, there's a discomfort in admitting that you may not know something, in admitting or acknowledging your humanity, in owning a failure, there's discomfort in that. And that's what creates, I think, the misalignment around leadership 
in our culture. And I think it's a it's an opportunity for all of us, frankly. For sure. Can you give it as an example of a, in hindsight, that you understood that you made a mistake and how did you work with it in order to learn from it and to deliver to your team this mistake? Did you speak with them? Sure. Um, I think, you know, one of the mistakes that I make regularly and that I really try to check myself around is undermining someone else's authority. Not on purpose, by accident, because I sometimes, you know, I'm, I'm, I have ADHD, whatever. I discovered it as an adult. I think it's part of my secret sauce, right? I, I, I have a lot of energy and I'm constantly moving and thinking and trying to address an issue or, but sometimes it's not for me to fix. Sometimes it's not for me to act on. And I think, especially as I empower this leadership team, to own their disciplines, to own their, their people, their, their teams. I sometimes without thinking, think I'm solving a problem. And so I'll go directly to the person that I've identified a problem with and try to solve it. And what I've done is gone around the process that I've tried to enable my leadership team to put in place. So I wish I could name a single instance. The problem is I do it probably more than I should, you know, um, and, and that's not like weekly or daily or whatever. It's, you know, a few times a year, I find myself being the problem because mm -hmm. I have gone directly to a person, tried to solve a problem. And what I've done is actually create more work for other people or I've scared them. I've scared them because suddenly the CEO is, you know, on the phone or in the room and trying to, you know, push a solution when they've been working on something else. Or I've, you know, made a phone call or, or become a barrier to progress where that wasn't at all what I intended to do. So I, I think for me, it's about sitting still and letting what I believe actually work. Um, because not everybody is going to work at the pace that I do and not everybody is going to communicate in the way that I do, or not everybody is going to see the problem in the exact same way that I do. That doesn't mean they don't have intention to solve it. So that's not a great anecdotal example, but I think it, it, it tells you where my weakness is. First of all, I love it from a few viewpoints. First of all, the fact that you are aware of yourself and your mistakes, you know, so it, I think as a leader, we need to be aware of our uh, weaknesses. So you know that you are really a doer and you need to, things to get really quickly and sometimes you get in the way. So, but it's start with knowing ourselves, right? Being mindful to ourselves. So this is the first thing. I, it really resonates with me because I think if I would have checked, I would also have an HDAD. I didn't check it because I'm also a really doer. But you know, this is what nice and this really resonates with me, this issue right nowadays. It's in, in my research and my PhD, I found that the, we need to hold that the modern world contains a lot of tensions, right? Between the speed and quality, the employees' needs and the company's needs, the long term and short term. But the main, the essential tensions that we need to learn nowadays to embrace as leaders is between the doing mode and the being mode, right? Because we mm -hmm. learned as leaders and managers that we need to have the right resource to, to be active, to be all, all the time in, in uh, meetings and to really show that we are busy. But actually, the new theory shows, and also reality, that we need to embrace the ability to pause, to listen, to reflect, and walk from this place. And then it will be much more accurate and will enable things to go on the right path. And it really resonated with me because as doers, and I think both of other doers, we, we sometimes do too much and we actually ruin the process mm -hmm. and what the the word that I embrace nowadays and actually also practice is to surrender it's okay mm. to take a few breaths and it's okay that you don't know what's the right path it's okay that the energy is slower that I'm not in the doing mode right now I'm giving myself a grace and it's a, a tough practice for me I'm sure it's also for you yeah <laughs> mm -hmm. to, to surrender to the process and to really trust and it connects to the trust issue because once we're on the right path, we need to, to let go, as you said, to let go and create space for things to emerge. So we need to write 
to find the right balance between doing and when we need to let go and enable uncertainty to occur. And then, as you said, the, the solution will emerge from your team and maybe they will bring the right solution instead of you giving them the solution that actually might be the problem. What do you mm-hmm. think about it? I actually love the word surrender. I think it, it's, a, it's a great reminder word, you know, to let go. And it's interesting because this year, you know, I always have, I always move into a new year committed to trying to do incrementally better. In other words, I'm not somebody who ever says, I'm going to go on a diet and lose 400 pounds, or I'm going, my company's going to grow by a hundred percent, or I don't make these massive, I don't set these massive goals for myself. Um, you know, we've experienced some phenomenal growth in the last year, not because of me, because I have actually succeeded at surrendering. And I think that in, in moving into this year, I'm still committed to incremental growth. But for the first time, I think in my entire career, I have really committed to carving out time for that surrender. And not just in the context of how I manage or lead, but also in the context of how I live. Um, you know, I want to, I want to surrender more time for myself, for silence, for contemplation, for centering, for movement, for, you know, the reason that you see this refrigerator behind me that I mentioned to you earlier is because I'm alone in a cottage in northern Wisconsin. And when we're done here, I'm going for a long walk and it's just starting to snow. And that is part of my plan to surrender more silence, more more thinking time, less pressure to do, to run, to show up for everything. Um, because I think it'll make me a better leader. And I have literally never given myself that kind of time in my whole career. Wow. So that's amazing. I really love it. And I, yes, this is exactly what I said. It's giving yourself the time and space uh, to just be. So mm-hmm. both nature, for me, nature is the best meditation ever. Yes. You know, to contemplate. And, you know, you said something, it circles back also to the beginning of our conversation. You talked about compassion. And I think also giving ourselves compassion and love and, and this time, you know, and I really believe that as leaders at the end of the day, if we lead a balanced life, also in a personal life, or so it will impact our companies, right? Because we will be more balanced, we will be more calm. So we'll bring this kind of energy to our companies, right? Otherwise, if we will be stressed out or run after our tails, this is what we'll bring to our company and we won't be able to be on the cutting edge because we'll do more of the same, reacting mm-hmm. to everything instead of responding and taking, being a proactive to where we want to lead our companies. So it's like counterintuitive, like taking the time off and contemplating and giving ourselves time. But at the end of the day, from my experience, it makes us even more productive and efficient and much more creative. So I think, what do you think? I see you agree with me. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I, I don't know what it is about me that, you know, sort of prevented that. In fact, you know, I've noticed and I've commented many times, especially in the last 10 years, that I have people around me who take sabbaticals and I have never taken a sabbatical, never once. I haven't taken more than a couple of weeks off. And even that's pushing it. I would say that I'm disconnected. I've never been disconnected. I don't know who I'm fooling. I tried to, I tried to go there, but I, I can't. And I, I agree. I, I, I wish as a culture we valued our silences as much as we valued our busyness and we don't. And there's something about us that feels like busyness is a badge of honor. And I, I, I preach to people in my talks all the time that that's not true, but I've never actually taken a dose of my own medicine. So there's, there's the rub, there's my confession. And I intend to do that this year and forever. And part of it too is, you know, I am older. I, 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 I don't mean to say that I'm a senior citizen, but I am, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Gen X, older Gen X worker who's, who's also sort of looking at what I want the last 10 years of my career to look like, you know, mm-hmm. or the last 15 years, whatever it ends up being. And, and I don't want it to be as busy. I want it to be better. 
It's interesting as we grow, we appreciate more of the quality time mm-hmm. and doing right, things right instead of, as you said, being too much busy. So first of all, it's interesting because it's really, I really believe that it's leading by example. So even if we preach for, to our employees to take time off and to uh, be compassionate to themselves, but if we don't do it, so actually the message that we are sending is, okay, don't take. So you say mm-hmm. you find this gap between inviting them to take the time off, but you didn't give it to yourself. So it's interesting that you're embar- you understood it and now you're embarking on this journey and doing it for yourself. So I think, first of all, this will resonate with, in the company among the employees because they understand beyond words that it's important for you. This is a great, important value for you. Mm-hmm. But going forward, what else do you think that you can do in your company to really enable people to, to better listen to themselves, to take their time off, to find the right balance in order to have their well-being, you know, in order not to get burned out? Then we mm-hmm. actually yeah, lose them. Yeah. I, so actually, I think the company, I think, I think for the people that I work with, I've done a fine job of that. I don't think that they look at me and go, oh, she's working all the time. I have to, too. I don't know that I am always visible to the, you know, the folks that I work with because my job looks different. I always say I manage up and out and the leadership team is managing the day to day. So I don't think they're looking at me going, wow, she's working all the time. So I have to, too. I also think that because we've always put people first, we've also really done a fine job of making space for rest for them, encouraging rest. You know, we when we see people haven't taken vacation time, we encourage that vacation time. You know, we were just we were just closed for the week for the end of the year, the week before the end of the year. We call that our winter break. Um, and everybody just goes and takes a nap for a solid week. Um, we have more holidays and PTO time available than the average small business in my experience. And we also have what we call flexible Fridays. So if people are done with their work, they can be done. You know, we don't measure people's value by the time they spend at their desks. We measure their value by what they're able to produce and whether or not we're meeting our targets. And so I think we've always done really well with that. And it's why we've won a lot of culture awards, but there's more to it than just saying, go take a nap, right? Um, there's, it, there, there's making space for the whole person, which I think we've also done really well at. I do think the entire world is, you know, the entire working world is in the middle of an existential crisis right now. Everybody is feeling burned out, even or people at my organization where we encourage rest and time away and silence, people feel burnout. And I think that has more to do with the state of the world than it does with work always, at least where we're concerned. And when we had our end of year staff meeting, what I tried to encourage people to recognize is work can be the problem, you know, or you can find purpose here and work can be the respite. We're not trying to beat people to death. We don't want people to work beyond what they're capable of working. We want people to feel like they're showing up as their best selves. So if we really focus on the relationships we have with each other and our clients, if we're really focused on creating that safe space, that psychologically safe space for each other, if we're really focused on continuing to evolve our culture in a healthy way, this can be a relief versus part of the problem. But we all have to understand that and commit to it. And we have to be in it together. It's not something I can just do because I'm the CEO. You know, because I think part of the reason for the crisis we're all we're all experiencing is we're all so far away from our purpose. We mm-hmm. forgot why we got here. Why are we doing this in the first place? Why did I choose this career? I believe, you know, I work in technology, but I don't think I chose this career. I don't think my purpose is about the technology itself. It's about what it can do for us and what it can allow us to do for each other. And by thinking like that, I think I can create a company that where I'm not just a leader of an organization, but we are leading by example. And that is something that I still feel very purposeful about. And that's something that excites me about the work and helps me to wake up every day. 
Amazing. So you said actually that we're in a situation now in the workplaces that we lost our purpose and our meaning. And actually, this is what we are searching nowadays. The new generation, the Z, the Y, they're looking for meaningfulness in the workplace, right? And this is what will empower them and fulfill them. And then they actually find the excitement in the workplace, not in, out of it, but we need to find to really pause sometimes and to ask ourselves tough questions. How are we, do we know what our why? Maybe we change our why change because we evolve as human beings, right? Maybe two years ago, you had a different why and now it changed and evolved and you keep pivoted. And instead mm-hmm. of responding automatically, it comes back to the ability to pause once in a while and really reflect and ask ourselves, are we in the, the right way? Maybe we need to change. Maybe something is not working for us anymore. And to be brave and courageous enough to look at it in the mirror and continue on. So it comes mm-hmm. back again to the ability to pause and redirect our way, right? Mm-hmm. Well, and also, you know, you talked about the book at the beginning of this discussion. And um, the the subtitle of the book is Finding and Using Your Power at Work right? The, the, a kick in the pants guide to finding and using your power at work. What I believe people have to recognize is they have agency. You're not a victim of your career. You're driving it. You are not stuck in a job for 30 or 40 years. You can change. You have an education or life experience or work experience that is of value someplace. You do not have to stay in a job where you don't feel any amount of fulfillment. And that is a legacy feeling that we've been gifted with by our parents, right? Like our parents who worked a job for 30 years and collected a pension, they made us feel like you have to do that. But I think we've already sort of figured out that in order to rise up the ranks inside of organizations, oftentimes people have to move away from them, right? But I also think that we don't have to do that just to make more money and get a better title. We can also take a step back and be planful about our next move and consider what brings us joy or that sense of purpose. We do not have to stay in a place forever simply because that feels safe and stable. Our stability comes from within, not from a job. So right. And sometimes we need to take a leap, right? Leap of faith comes back to trust. Leap of faith that we're listening to our intuition that we are not in alignment anymore with our values and the, the company change, I change, and it doesn't, we don't have any much alignment anymore. And we need to go forward and to have the, to take the risk to mm-hmm. let go and create space for something new. And I think also as leaders, sometimes we were attached to people that we recruited. And sometimes we need to understand that the alignment is not there anymore. And to really respect them as human beings, as complete human beings that evolved that they don't fit anymore to the company. It doesn't mean that the, the employee is not good or the company is not good. It also means that only means that we went different places and that's okay. This is part of the evaluation, evolution and a process and progress. Mm-hmm. So I think this is a new paradigm that we need to adopt as leaders, right? Mm-hmm. Not to be attached. And the fact that the employee leaves me doesn't mean that he doesn't love me and, you know, sits on my emotional aspect. No, to understand it. He finished. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Here and I want to evolve. And I think this is circles back to the ego part. I think as leaders, right, as managers, it touches us really deep and uh, mm-hmm. emotionally and it's hard for us to, to implement. Mm-hmm. That's absolutely true. I, I actually had an experience like that where, somebody that I worked with for 20 years was a dear, dear friend. And we just came to a, an end, not an end in our friendship, but uh, a, an end in our working relationship. We didn't even have misaligned values. I just think we had a misaligned sense of how it should happen, how it should, how we should move forward. And, you know, it was terrifying when it happened because we had developed this real, um, rhythm to our working relationship. And I think we both found a new sense of freedom and accomplishment when we decided to part ways and our friendship is strong. And so, yeah, I've, I've been in that spot exactly. 
And that's amazing because, you know, this is the new workplaces because this is the networks, right? Now she moves mm-hmm. on and you moves on and maybe you, you continue in the, in the future. Maybe you can connect each other. So I think even understanding the long-term relationships that it mm-hmm. can help us navigate in, in the work environment, connect people, recruit new people. It's such an important essence the connection that we have, and it doesn't mean that if we separate it now, it doesn't mean that we won't continue to go forward and be in contact and maybe help each other in different vendors. So mm-hmm. I really love it. And so we can continue for hours, but we need to wrap up. So is there any question that I didn't ask you that you want to refer to? No, I think this has been a great conversation. It was lovely and fluid, and I really appreciated it. Yes, I also enjoyed it. So Nancy, if people want to reach out to, to you, where can they find you? Well, they can find my companies at clockwork.com or made by tempo. Tempo is a small digital studio. Uh, they can find me at nancylyons.com or I'm on all the socials at, uh, at nylons. Great. Thank you very much and a happy new year. <laughs> Thank you. Happy new year to you. Hope you enjoyed the conversation. You're invited to subscribe to our podcast in order to know when we upload a new episode and follow us on social media. Thank you for listening. Until next time, take care and bye-bye.